on the 24th day of October, Halloween gave to me 24 soggy corpses, 23 shadows creeping, 22 Egyptian eyeballs, 21 acid raves, 20 creepy stalkers, 19 Kiernan's time traveling, 18 zombie swatting, 17 Kegner screeching, 16 flying engines, 15 workplace accidents, 14 logs of bouncing, 13 planes exploding, 12 zombie soldiers, 11 angels wrestling, 10 ghostly hitchhikers, 9 basement clowns, 8 vampire cruises, 7 silent heroes, 6 prequel bloodstones, 5 diabolical fledglings, 4 vampire pianists, 3 dead professors, 2 Michelle actresses, and a radu drooling something bloody. Hey there, folks. Welcome to the 31 Days of Halloween on uh, the 24th of October. We have one week to go until the big day, and we're going to do one more trilogy of films. And that is, uh, of course, Creep Show. If you saw the show title, uh, we are going to do Creep Show, Creep Show 2, and Creep Show 3. Uh, I have yet to watch Creep Show 3. I hear it's terrible. Great. <laughs> Let's explore that. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that in a couple of days. So, Creep Show is over forty years old at this point, which blows my mind. But that I guess makes sense. It was uh, originally released in nineteen eighty two. Of course, all the stories written by Stephen King. It is directed by Papa Bear himself, George A. Romero, and it is. I like when I watched this. I hadn't seen it in a long time, and it might be a perfect movie. It's very silly, and intentionally so. That's not a knock. And even... Uh, so, hmm, let's take this uh, just piece by piece. Uh, it starts off with the wraparound, which is Joe Hill of, uh, you know, Stephen King's son and horror author, uh, all his own, Nosferatu, and so forth. Um he is a kid who uh, has the good luck to have Tom Atkins as a father. Although this version of Tom Atkins, uh, fairly abusive, like smacking his kid for having a copy of the comic book Creep Show, which is, of course, an homage to the EC horror comics, as all of this is. This is one big EC comic, uh, which is one of the things that makes it beautiful and wonderful and all of that. And... It is uh, a, a pretty good wrap around. It it's just Tom Atkins giving Joe Hill the business for having it, and then he throws it away. And then Joe Hill creepily looks at the window with a grin, and we see the you know the crypt keeper equivalent, the creep of uh, Creep Show, uh, an animatronic in the window, like hey hey I got you. Don't worry about it. I got your back, kid. And then he becomes an animated character, and we uh, go down to the trash can, and the uh, comic flips open, and we begin our movie. And the first of the, the stories is Father's Day, which is uh, a good way to start, because it's probably, if not the most traditional, it feels like the most traditional EC horror comic story. And it's weird to see Ed Harris this young. And I guess uh, he is in this largely because of um, the movie he did with George Romero. Was it Nighthawk? Something like that? Where uh, it's people jousting on motorcycles and whatnot. I can't remember if that was pre this or post this, but uh, around there. And it's the story of... Old Aunt Bedelia, who is sort of a, a matriarch of the family. She's very wealthy. But the reason that everybody in the family is wealthy is because her father was horrible and had a stroke. And Bedelia decides she's going to take care of him or gets stuck taking care of him is sort of how it sounds. And one Father's Day, he is being especially terrible. Oh, and also murdered Bedelia's would-be husband, the man that was going to take her away from all of this. And so one day, Aunt Bedelia, uh, as the uh, patriarch of the family, is banging his cane on the arms of his chair and saying he wants his Father's Day cake. Uh, Bedelia picks up a marble ashtray and brains him and kills him. 
And every Father's Day, she comes to the estate and has a few drinks by the grave. And then they all have a, a, a Father's Day dinner and go about their uh, their lives. And so it's Bedelia and her sister and then um, the sister's kids, two kids, one of whom is married to Ed Harris. So there's four of them plus, and Bedelia makes five uh, to have this dinner. And of course, uh, at, at this particular Father's Day, the patriarch of the clan, uh, Nathan Grantham, uh, comes crawling out of his grave and gets his cake. And it is uh, very traditional. The, the one knock I have is when Ed Harris goes looking for Aunt Bedelia and finds uh, her or finds the grave of Nathan Grantham and falls down and the uh, monument starts to teeter over as if it's going to fall on him. He takes his sweet damn time in trying to get up. Uh, and of course, doesn't ultimately get up. He gets crushed, but what are you going to do? Um, but that is made up for by the fact that Ed Harris dancing is right up there with, with Crispin Glover dancing in Friday the 13th Part 4 as far as crazy dancing on screen. Crispin Glover is expected to be a crazy dancer. Ed Harris, pleasant surprise that he is a crazy dancer. So uh, that's the first story. Then the second story is the one that I always felt like I liked the least, which is The Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill. It's the, the Stephen King one. And Stephen King is no actor. I think he would be the first to tell you that he's no actor. But he's kind of perfect for this. It's a big cartoon of a story where a, a meteor lands and he uh, thinks he's going to become rich and he's going to be able to pay off uh, his his loans and so forth by selling uh, this meteor to the Department of Meteors at the local university. And in a, a hilarious daydream where... The guy's like, I'll, you know, the, the, whoever is heading up the Department of Meteors tells him, like, I will give you $75 for this meteor. And he's like, 200 my meteor, my price. And it's very funny. And Jordy Verrill is just a dumbass. Like, he refers to himself as a lunkhead, and he is. And uh, anyway, the meteor cracks open, and it's got some kind of super plant inside that starts growing on everything, including him. And he talks about how his luck is always bad. And our ending, if you've never seen Creepshow, the ending of this story, is Jordy Verrill, more plant than man at this point, uh, saying that he hopes his luck is in just this once because he wants to shoot himself and put himself out of his misery. Uh, and he needs the shotgun to be loaded. And sure enough, his luck is in. But there's, of course, a twist, as there is with uh, most of these stories. And, uh, yeah, and it's, you know, the, the twist is sort of about there being a green summer in Maine. And you see these plants growing towards town. Uh, it's, it's a good story. It's a good EC Comics kind of story. It's very silly and fun. And I really enjoyed it. I used to think that I hated this segment of Creepshow. And now I'm like, eh, I think Father's Day is kind of my least favorite because it's the most traditional. And this is just so bonkers. And Romero is having fun with like crazy Dutch angles. And like the, the when Jordy Verrill sees that there's plants growing on the tips of his fingers and he's thinking about going to the doctor and, and the doctor like sailing by in this Dutch angle in a, a rolling desk chair like going from one side of the frame to the other for no apparent reason. And it's just wonderful. All that stuff is so good. Um, I really appreciated it more this time than I think I ever had. So that was great. There was, um, you know, a, a real kind of joy to that one. And, and so, yeah, I really like Lonesome Death of, of Jordy Verrill. And then the next one is... The one with uh, Ted Danson and Leslie Nielsen, where Leslie Nielsen is a cuckolded husband who discovers that his uh, his wife is cheating with Ted Danson, and you know an '80s Ted Danson on uh, why on earth uh, why on earth wouldn't you? Um, 
And uh, the, the segment is called Something to Tide You Over because what happens is that Leslie Nielsen confronts Ted Danson, tells him if he wants to see Becky, the, the wife in question, again, he will do as Leslie Nielsen asks. Leslie Nielsen takes him to a beach, forces him to get in a hole and help bury himself up to his neck. And then Leslie Nielsen sets up a video camera uh, as well as a closed circuit television so Ted Danson can see that Becky is in the same situation only further down the beach. And so as the tide comes in, she will drown. And he is in the same predicament. And uh, before the water can cover him, there is a moment where Ted Danson looks at the camera as Leslie Nielsen watches the closed circuit televisions from home. And Ted Danson tells him, like, I'm going to, I'll get you, Richard. And, uh, and then there's a wonderful shot of Ted Danson completely submerged with his head, uh, you know, like sunk up to the neck in the sand, his hair floating around him. It's just a beautiful, like, EC horror comic shot. And it's wonderful. I love it so much. And so, of course, uh, Becky and Ted Danson uh, come back to wreak their revenge by uh, taking Leslie Nielsen down to the beach, who uh, is buried up to his neck, and, and it ends with him screeching, I can hold my breath a long time, ha ha ha, which is the advice he gives them. There was also an alternate ending to this, and I can't remember if it was shot or not, but it's it's kind of the same thing because uh, as I said, you know, his, his advice to Ted Danson is stay calm. You might be able to get out of this if you hold your breath. You need to hold your breath uh, a long time. And the uh, one, the alternate ending is that Leslie Nielsen, after his home is invaded by these waterlogged zombies, um, he calls the police to show them the closed circuit camera footage he keeps of his home. To show them, like, hey, look, there were zombies here, I swear. And instead, what he shows the police is his last conversation with Ted Danson about murdering him and Becky. And they're like, ah, we got you, pal. And so the last scene is him being sentenced to death in a, the gas chamber. And it's the same line, like, I can hold my breath for a long, long time. Only it's in reference to um, not uh, breathing in the poison gas. But... I, I like the water ending, you know, it's more symmetrical going full circle with it, but that's not a terrible ending. If that had been the ending, I, I, I probably would have been fine with it. And so that's the end of something to tide you over. Then there is the fourth story, which is the crate, which is, I think the longest uh, runtime wise of all the stories which is Fritz Weaver and Hal Holbrook as university buddies. They're both professors. And Hal Holbrook has the misfortune in this case. No, ordinarily, I would say, if you're married to Adrian Barbeau, you're doing great. In this case, uh, this is Wilma, a.k.a. Billy. Call me Billy. Everybody calls me Billy. Um, and she is awful. She is a horrible, horrible woman. She drinks too much. Uh, when we first meet them, they're at a faculty party where she is loud and drunk and vulgar. And you can tell that Hal Holbrook hates her. Fritz Weaver feels bad for his buddy. Almost tells him, hey, I can't come over and play chess with you anymore because your wife is so fucking terrible. But ends up uh, kind of saying, you know, I, I'll be there. But gets a call from the university because a, a janitor there has discovered a crate underneath uh, some stairs that is um, dated back to an Arctic expedition in 1834. And so Fritz Weaver goes to the university to check it out because he's a professor of zoology and the graduate student uh, is missing, is AWOL. And he shows up and he and the janitor open up this crate which houses this uh, furry beast that Tom Savini designed and it's it's a little bit of you know dude in suit but it's a pretty interesting monster design even though it's not terribly convincing but again you're talking about a big comic book of a movie so kind of who cares that it's not you know the most realistic thing you ever saw 
and I think they called it fluffy on on the set. If I'm, I may make that have made that up, but uh, I believe that's true. At any rate, uh, so it kills the janitor. Uh, Fritz Weaver has a good old fashioned freak out about it. The graduate student shows back up, and Fritz Weaver is like, "Hey, we got to call somebody because th- there's a thing in a crate that ate." Uh, Mike, the janitor, and Charlie, the graduate student, is like, uh, did you kill somebody, Professor? He's like, no, I didn't do this. There's a monster in a crate. Don't you believe me? And so the graduate student goes to check it out and, of course, becomes meal number two for this monster in a crate. So Fritz Weaver, worried that he is going to be on the hook for two murders, goes to Hal Holbrook's house. Uh, Billy is out uh, for the evening. And Hal Holbrook is like, huh, so a monster in a crate that seems to devour the bones and everything of its victims, you say. Tell you what, why don't you have another drink? Don't worry about it. I absolutely did not slip you a Mickey, which he totally does. And Fritz Weaver is knocked out. Hal Holbrook goes to the university, cleans up all the blood and shit, and leaves a note for Billy Uh, So when she gets home, she reads this note that says like, hey, my buddy Fritz Weaver got a girl in some trouble. She is freaked out. She is crying and beside herself at the university. You know, I, I can't do anything on my own, Billy. If you would come to the university and help me out like you always help me out with everything, I would really appreciate it. And she does. She, you know, takes any opportunity to make her husband look like an idiot. And so she shows up at the university and uh, the whole scheme is how Holbrook is going to get the monster in the crate to eat Adrian Barbeau, which is what happens, but only <laughs> only after um, there's a, a great moment where he tries to get the monster to eat her. And it's like, just tell it to call you Billy. And he's like slamming her against the crate and the monster just doesn't come out right away. And he kind of exhausted and, and confused, you know, steps back as Adrian Barbeau is leaning against the crate. And the look on his face is like, God damn it. You know, like I really thought I was going to get rid of her this time. And uh, Adrian Barbeau is just giving him the business about it, too. It's so good. Uh, the crate is fantastic. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful segment. It, it's the longest because there's just more moving pieces and the character work is really fun. And these aren't, you know, incredibly three dimensional characters or anything, but it's a nice morality play. Like nobody's a hero and it may be for its weaver a little bit, but nobody's a good guy in the crate. It's just a series of people who are worse. Uh, because you know, in a perfect world, Hal Holbrook just gets a divorce, right? He doesn't have to feed a woman to a monster in a crate, but you know, we don't have a movie if that doesn't happen. Anyway, it's very good. Uh, the crate is fantastic, and of course, the last one is uh, a segment called "They're Creeping Up on You," featuring Fritz, uh, not Fritz Weaver, E.G. Marshall, and the whole uh, bit of this one is that he is a neat freak and a germaphobe. And also this horrible businessman type. And it's weird when I was watching this one. This almost plays better now than it did then. Just because of all the billionaire types. Like the celebrity billionaires that we have now. And uh, I think that helps inform this a little bit. And makes it a little more of... A, a, a little more potent of, of a commentary. And... Anyway, it's just him, you know, like because of this hostile takeover a bit of a business, the former CEO has killed himself and he's delighting in that and has this phone call with the wife and he's just like, hey, I don't give a shit about you or your husband. He, he was terrible at business and fuck him. Fuck you. Uh, the only thing I'm worried about is keeping all these bugs. I saw a roach in my sterile white apartment earlier. And that's freaked me out. And of course, like roaches start appearing all over the place and they're in his bed, which leads to the fantastic last shot of him lying dead in the floor of his pristine apartment. And uh, you, you don't see a single roach until one crawls out of his mouth and then they start erupting from his face and chest and everything. And it's, uh, it's gruesome and wonderful and I loved it all. Uh, so, and, and then we get the tag on the wraparound 
which is uh, Billy, uh, a.k.a. Joe Hill, having ordered a voodoo doll from uh, the, the issue of Creepshow that is thrown away. As Tom Savini, as a garbage man, points out, somebody already ordered a voodoo doll. And yeah, yeah, and we see Tom Atkins like grabbing his throat in pain as Billy gives him uh, the once over with this voodoo doll. And that's kind of it. And you know, it's a it's two hours. I usually have a rule about uh, horror movies not being over uh, 90 minutes as a rule. But you know, when you're talking about five stories in an anthology, um, each one is less than half an hour. I mean, I, I'd have to look again and see where the crate falls, but uh, even that doesn't ever wear out its welcome. I'll, like Everything moves at its own pace. Uh, maybe Father's Day drags a little bit, but I think it's just because, again, that is the most traditional of the stories. It's just fantastic. Creepshow's fucking great. It's a great, great horror movie. I hadn't seen it in a long time, and watching it this time of year on Blu-ray, and it's just so in love with its material. It loves the stories that it's telling. Romero is clearly having a blast with this. So is King in his role and in the writing of it. It's it's just like a perfect version of those EC comics. It's it's wonderful uh, the way that the, the shots themselves are framed as a comic book at times. Um, the, the lighting that Romero uses that stark like reds and blues and, and the crazy backgrounds and everything. It's just, you know, it's, it's stylish. It's, uh, it's confident. The music is really fun. Yeah. Uh, the performances are great. Like everybody's taking it seriously, except for King, which, you know, and, and the trivia says, that Romero told him to play the role like Wile E. Coyote, and he sure does. Uh, but it's it's great. Creepshow's fucking great. Um, but now on to Creepshow 2 and 3, and I know how I feel about Creepshow 2 at least, and it's not as positive. And I hear Creepshow 3 is a real disaster, so we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. But for now... Folks, I'm in such a great mood because I watch Creepshow. And if you haven't seen it in a long time or if you've never seen it, I'm leaving out plenty of detail that makes Creepshow wonderful. If you've never seen it, watch Creepshow. Creepshow is so good. It's, it's a great Halloween movie. It, like it makes a nice double feature with like a trick or treat because both of those movies love horror movies and love that kind of semi campy but not not cynical you know it's campy without being cynical and and ironic about its love of, of its material it's having fun with it it's playing with the style of it it understands that there's an inherent silliness in some of this but that doesn't mean that it doesn't adore it and that's such a a, a nice line to walk where knowing that your material isn't you know faulkner <laughs> And, but also being like, but yes, not everything is Faulkner. Some things are just the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill. And it can be a wonderful version of the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill. And that's what this is. It's, it's just terrific. I love Creepshow so much. I had forgotten how much I loved it until I watched it again. So, uh, as I said, if you haven't seen it in a long time, give it a, give it a spin. It, it will treat you right. I promise you. Uh, all right. That is it for this 24th day of Halloween, we've got seven days and seven movies left. So, uh, what are we wasting time for? Let's get to it. Have yourself an amazing Tuesday out there, everybody. I will see you back here on Wednesday for Creep Show Two and another film in the 31 days of Halloween. See you then. Oh.